Oh, hi, this is Kathy Ram from the Netherlands. Um, I'm here with Brutally Delicious Podcast and check it out. Thank you for joining me. I've got to tell you, I reached out to Katie after I first heard the signal, and I love yeah. this stuff. Oh, I'm thank you. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. I think it's it's been recently picked up this kind of genre in music uh, a little bit more, like having a little bit of a wider reach than ever before. And, and it's so nice to hear the feedback of of all of this material. Yeah. And to learn, so yeah. A couple of years ago, I came across um, Sylvain, which I think, I mean, while it's not exactly the same, it's sort of the same sort of vein. She's got that real ethereal voice, folky thing going on and, you know, a little bit yeah. of metal. And it's just so great. And I think yeah. the dynamic yeah. and the dimensions to it make it amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I. By the way, I love Sylvain's work. So it's really nice you mention her sort of in one breath uh, to what I'm doing. Uh, of course, yeah, we, uh, she's also, she's from Norway and I work with material from the North. Uh, right. I, I bring it a little bit broader to like all of Scandinavia, old Icelandic historical sources and mythology from all over the North, you could say. And so right. also this album, it's been recorded in Iceland, in Norway, in Finland, you know, we've really been traveling to, to capture the sound and the landscape and also some guest musicians from there or specific instruments. So it's really, really nice. To yeah, so we'll get to that in a minute because I've got a million questions yeah. to come into this yeah. short little interview. But why do you think, I mean, obviously you're not metal and this is a metal show and it appeals to me, but why do you think there's such a connection to the metal world with what you're doing? I can't explain it. I'm hoping you yeah. have it's difficult to explain that connection, but on the other hand, I think also from an earlier time, things went a little bit hand in hand there. Of course, we see, for example, the origin of Norwegian black metal, you know, it's it's such a dark landscape for many, many winter months. And I think there's also been sort of this urge to really express yourself without limitation. And yeah. uh, there's also a connection to the occult arts, of course, that we see uh, very prevalent in in uh, metal music and design yes. around that and, this, and the scenery and topics that are portrayed on, on stages. And so I think if you would sort of condense my music to the Nordic dark folk, um, also mystical realm, I think there is actually some, some direct overlap there. And uh, even though it's a little bit more quieter, I would say it, it's kind of metal in, in its approach where we don't want to uh, leave out a certain aspects of, for example, nature that are really raw and powerful. And so even though these instruments are like centuries old, they are still able to really uh, push and drive sort of the limits of your speaker, uh, if you will. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's dive in even deeper. So I know this is, this is super emotional music and super ethereal or whatever, but... Do you ever feel too vulnerable, like you put too much of yourself into these songs? Because I imagine there's a lot of you in there, right? Yeah, exactly. I I don't really feel too vulnerable. I think it's actually something I rather embrace uh, because I, I don't think we should um, just like sort of act out a certain emotion in our voice or in our songs, but really embody it to actually touch base with it, to really become the song we are singing and so yeah there's a vulnerability aspect to that but on the other hand i think it's also the most purest form of doing art is to really immerse yourself in it and also when i look at these records there are actually some takes where whether it's anger or another emotion sadness um you know sometimes the voice actually breaks uh, from like a sad emotion sort of that that comes into your throat you know like and and so you have that little uh, dryness to the voice but I think right. that's the beautiful moment and of course you could choose to do another take and take you know the the best one pitch right. perfect 
but I think music it is one of our po most powerful ways to convey emotion and to sort of be able to say let's keep that in there let's be raw and real and really embody that I think it's more powerful to the listener as well it's more relatable as well and also if I look at for example a more, more heavy you know like a uh, more angry kind of punk sort of sounds that we have going on in one of the tracks where I really sort of unle unleash this feminine rage there of course also you can say well vocal wise this is not like the purest form of singing like but it's actually that raw grunting that daring to be less beautiful and sweet and pretty perfect but to be really raw and and unfiltered you could say i think that's really really pure and i really also like the connection so in my audio i also really like to play with doing like a, a lower more uh, earthy grunting uh or like that that rawness and rasp in the voice and then to flavor it and combine it with these more softer mystical and higher pitched layers so yeah yeah you hit it right on the head it's it's very uh organic i guess is a good word and i think in a time when like everything is so polished and produced like in the pop world in the country world it's nice mm -hmm. like that and i think the early pioneers in you know norwegian black metal were onto that as well right yeah. decidedly lo-fi and steering clear of all this final polishing just to make it i think more organic and real and connectable yeah exactly and there's also of course there's the layer to it what if you perform something like that in the studio, if you would do take after take after take, it sort of loses the power of the moment yes. um, because then you're more focused on technique. And I think first and foremost, and this is also something metal scene has in common with this genre, uh, with dark folk or like Nordic folk, um, is that I think we really put that truth, emotional uh, thing on the forefront. And so that you cannot do take after take. You have to be really in the moment and you can't reenact re that, you know, all the time. You just have to, yeah, accept in a way how it right. sounds and work with that in, in the most crafty way. Of course, we do have studio solutions for something if it's really off limits, you know. Right. No, uh, no, I'm I not going to say the album is not like all in one take, not at all. I mean, but it's it's really important, I think, also for me as an audio producer to find the balance there to say, okay, we have all the tools to our uh, availability to make something. But you don't have to use them all. But you don't have to use them all. And I think really finding that balance is, is very important. Also with these instruments, they are sort of living instruments. They have sound of their own. You know, if the temperature changes in the room, the strings will sound a little bit different, more colder or warmer, you know, like... But it's it's a matter of working with the material that you have recorded in in a nice way and and keeping the balance and and the oversight the meaning of the song in the forefront of you, yeah. Perfect. So we alluded to black metal. We've talked about how in the heck did you get the uh, one of the most famous black metal dudes gall on your on your record? How did that yeah. even come about? Well, how it came about was uh, me working with these old, old uh, medieval and Viking Age instruments. Um, 10, 15 years ago, there were very few players of that in Europe. Like we were a handful of people. And so uh, it was actually Vartruna. The, uh, it's a group from um, Norway. They also Yeah, they've were, actually been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. They are like also kind of like genre pioneers here. Um, you know, they also worked with these very old instruments and there already was a connection established. And so um, very naturally, I guessed it with them on a few shows uh, with my instrumentation and doing some backing vocals because there was that click. There was that recognition like, OK, you also work with this old material, like welcome, join the nerd club, you know, <laughs> and there I met Gal. And um, we clicked right away, like working with him feels so natural. So like we, we can understand each other in a, in a recording room without needing a lot of words. And, and I give him also a lot of room to really be bring himself and his sort of characters on, right. on, on the album. Um, and he knows, on the other hand, he can trust me with the audio engineering part and he knows it will be 
a very nice song, you know, and so he feels very comfortable working with me and also understands the energies that I'm trying to work with on this album, this thematics, you know, very deeply. So right. it's 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 a natural combination. I I really hear a lot like that our voices sort of work very well together. Yeah, that was my next thing. I mean, I listened to Stone yeah. Pillars and I'm like, holy cow, it works. You know, for me as an outsider, I don't live in, I've never even been to Scandinavia. He's got yeah. that, from what I see, just that, you know, like that scream or that black metal sort of thing going on. And to hear him yeah. harmonizing with you in the background or even side by side, maybe not even in the background, is amazing or nothing short yeah. of amazing. He's one of the best vocalists I know and has actually such a wide range. And of course, on on the set song that is already out, Stone Pillars, I also have two other male vocalists that are forming this sort of man choir that backs up these sort of witches brew that we we have on the foreground. With the, Which is with a the great lady. dichotomy as well, right? Because it's usually yeah. a male or you know a male dominated thing, and then the female yes. choir. So I think that's a really cool thing as well. Yeah. Exactly. We sort of reverse engineered that. And so now I have a male backing vocalist. And the other two are uh, Mitch Harris from Napalm Death and Yanni Peu, who is an amazing falsetto vocalist and also my producer together with me on this album. And so it was so natural to, to have those male voices also blend together and, and harmonize with me. And, and uh, not yeah. necessarily people you would think would be harmonizing anything right i mean napalm that <laughs> is heavy as hell yeah but but mitch harris has also um um same like yanni peo same like gal they actually have really broad interest in music also over different genres and a broad capability to capture different aspects of themselves with the voice Hello, Tom May here, host of Future Friday. I've spent the last 15 years on the road with my band, The Menzingers, where I've met all kinds of wild and fascinating people. So I started a podcast. On Future Friday, I talked to fellow musicians about the moments that made them, their passions outside of music, and the curiosities that tie us all together. I've also talked to the likes of UFO researchers, magicians, soldiers, and documentary filmmakers, and I'm constantly searching for folks that can shape and change our view of the world. You can check out Future Friday wherever you like. And so it's been so fun. Like really, we we were joking a lot, like this man choir, they sort of need a name of their own, you know, like these are the most unlikely characters to stand together yeah. and, and back me up on this song, but it's really beautiful. And also like they really feel and understand the material I'm singing about on this song. So it's, it's really, really nice. Yeah. Is there something you want your fans or your listeners to take away from after listening to, I don't know, this record or any of your music? Um, well, the album Saula, it's, it's been like a personal journey for me to craft this over the last years. And of course, every album track on this record specifically is tied into a team. Um, the Nine Daughters of Ran, which is like different uh, ocean waves of the sea that we see in Nordic mythology mentioned by name, by feminine name. And so I tied that together with different emotional states. And I think... If we look at the emotional inner world of ourselves, you know, the storms that can brew there or like the more, more beautiful uh, reflectionary moments. I think this is something that I hope people will be able to relate to, to be able to release your emotions through art and to immerse yourself in it, to sink sort of in the deep waters of that emotional body and um, ultimately come out on top, like to make it across, to reach new horizons on your sort of sea travel, you know, and uh, and navigate that journey within yourself as well and uh, allow and accept those emotions to be expressed and sort of uh, catalyzed by uh, releasing them uh, into peace, into resolution, into new shores, yeah, something like that. I hope people will at least be able to. Very cathartic, rest. for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What is I think that, what, yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. No, please. Sorry. Oh, well, I, I thought this also really kind of like ties in with the album title. It's it's called Saula, and this is an old Norse word for sea and soul. So it it is like about the body of the sea and everything around that that I could find in historic texts and mythology, but also the soul 
like the act of soul retrieval or like working through emotions and uh, processing Amazing. those. Yeah. Man, I could talk forever. We're going to be running up on time here because we started late, but I got a question for you. What does this look like live? And are you taking this on the road? And if so, are you taking the man choir with you? Well, actually, we've started very, very early on talks about bringing this live. I have talked to several musicians that perform on this album and singers. Um, it's something that at the moment I'm still playing with in my mind, even though I have really beautiful offers to bring this to the world actually with with colleagues of mine that i've worked with before with with people that are working with very professional booking agencies but again just like the album if i would do it because i'm first and foremost more a studio producer than a touring artist but if i would do it i think it would have to have a little bit more embodiment than just a concert of sorts because the material is so dense and so emotional I think I would more bring it into the realm of ritual performance with with sounds um, and with with these instruments on board. But well, the vision is still not completely crystallized yet. And if if there's one thing about my career in music is that I if I do it, I really want to bring something special. So at the moment, it's a little on hold. We're focusing on the album release first, but the ideas are they are boiling around a little so yeah that's where we are at when it comes to life yeah awesome i, I can't yeah. tell you i was out of all my interviews today this was the one i was looking forward to the most because i really really love it and I'm, i listen to it a lot and go wow this is emotional i guess is the best word it strikes it's a so note somewhere yeah oh that's wonderful to hear like to hear that it resonates with people and uh yeah they feel like this is also the feedback i get from listeners that I've had actually for such a long time. Like I'm I'm very happy with these people. I'm still reading all these messages that they write me right. personally because to hear that something meant a lot for them or that a song has been played on a funeral or like that they could release a part of themselves that they were grieving with or having trouble with. That for me, that's the power of music and also how how it works through in our community that's the yes. whole reason i would say we do this it's not for it's not for any other than that i think right. oh, that's fair enough and i think you yeah. succeeded tremendously it's, it's a beautiful record thank you thank you so much yeah if, fan, if fans want to get a hold of you can you give us all your socials and that sort of thing where they can find you yeah, I'm uh, on the web as Kati Ran. So uh, whether this is Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, uh, my own newly <laughs> made website, it's all Kati Ran. Um, if you go to katiran.com or Kati Ran on Instagram, you will find me. And uh, and there, of course, we have all the links to pre-sales, pre-saves of this album, beautiful products with my label, Svart Records from Finland. So I'm very easily to find i would say yeah thank you i'm sorry we had a rush through that i could talk to you forever because i really had a ton of questions maybe we could do a follow-up at some point i do have I'm a quick question for you yeah. I hate to run but i've got another one lined up no worries and good luck with this one thanks for having thank you me for the music be well bye. <laughs> bye cheers bye cheers one Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the One Hit Thunder or were nothing more than a one hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods.